also want to thank you all for coming out and braving the cold weather. I'd also like to thank the Bard Graduate Center, Peter Miller, Laura Minsky, and especially Gary Bird for organizing this, this really in, incredible, for me, symposium. So as Gary said, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about worry kipus, but in particular, I'm going to talk to you about one worry kipu that I call the large worry kipu. It's uh, it essentially, it was, it was a kipu that was recently donated to the Dumbarton Oaks um, by William and Barbara Conklin. And I'm going to talk about how this kipu can inform us not only about how wari kipus work in general, but how they differ and are similar to Inca kipus. And so my talk will focus on this large wari, wari kipu, which at 190 centimeters long, with secondary cords reaching 36 centimeters, and originally made of 1,000 individually made cords, it's the largest known wari kipu, both in its size and complexity. It demonstrates most of the attributes typical of wari kipus. As such, it provides the perfect case study with which to discuss wari kipus in general and how they both differ and resemble Inca and later kipus. So, which way? Okay. The large wari kipu was donated to the Dumbarton Oaks Museum and Collections in Washington, D.C. in 2016. The donation consisted of seven kipus and over 100 Andean textiles, mainly fragments, miniature bags, and other small fabrics. The kipus included three wari, and three Inca, and one canuto style colonial kipu, which you see here. The Conklins purchased the large wari kipu in 1978 from Jay Lyon, at the time a well-known New York art dealer, for about $800. William, better known as Bill, presented the large wari kipu for the first time in public in 1981, three years after he acquired it at the New York Academy of Sciences Conference on Ethnoastronomy and Archaeoastronomy in the American Tropics. The talk was entitled The Information System of Middle Horizon Kipus, and it was really um, revolutionary. It was published the following year in 1982 in a volume edited by Gary Erton and Anthony Avini entitled, uh, in the volume was entitled Ethnoastronomy and Archaeoastronomy in the American Tropics. Although the wa large wari kipu was known to the public, it always remained in the Conklin's possession and they always referred to it as in a private collection. It was essentially unavailable for scholarly study and therefore it received little scholarly attention. And that is until Sue Berg included it in her landmark exhibition, Wari Lords of the Ancient Andes, which opened in 2013 at the Cleveland Art Museum of Art. Berg published the exhibition in a catalog of the same name in 2012, and the catalog included the first color photo of the large Wari Kipu. When the Conklins acquired it in 1978, the large Wari Kipu was one of only a handful of known wrapped kipus, which is how they were referred to. These included a collection of nine, whoops, of nine that belonged to the Am Amano Museum in Lima. The Amano kipus came from a tomb that was looted in 1968 at Pampa Blanca in the Wairi Palpa region of Nazca. According to his son Mario, Yoshitaro, his father, picked the kipus from the sides of the tomb. Along with the kipus, Yoshitaro retrieved a number of ceramics from the tomb shown here. The ceramics are clearly Middle Horizon, and this was really the first time we knew for sure that, middle, that wrapped kipus were wari kipus. Anita Cook identified the double spout and bridge vessel as Epic 2A Benyake, which was probably made sometime between 8650 and 800. This date, however, is a tentative estimate because the dates for the middle horizon phases vary from area to area and are based on radiocarbon dates, all of which are from highland sites, and practically none of them indicate whether pottery was found in association with the carbon sample. The Amano kipus made it clear, as I said, that that keep that worry that wrapped kipus were worry kipus probably made um, during the middle horizon in the Amano. Uh, 
discovery confirmed that. The, um, whoops. Okay, this is the site of Pampa Blanca. Um, in 1969, less than a year after the discovery of the Pampa Blanca quipus in the Amano Museum, the American Museum of Natural History here acquired a wrapped and a wrapped loop and branch kipu for $700 from Louis Slavitz, another New York art dealer. The sale also included 30 Inca kipus. And I often wonder if the American Museum of Natural History kipu might have come from the same event that produced the Amano kipu since they were so closely related in time. In addition to the wari kipus at the Amano Museum and the American Museum of Natural History, the only other wari kipus known at the time that the large wari kipu was acquired were two loop and branch type kipus in the Museum of World Cultures in Gothenburg, Sweden. Both are related in color scheme and technical features suggesting they came from the same site, but they have no provenience other than Nazca, Peru, and they, came, they were donated much earlier in 1932. Interestingly, in 1978, the same year the Conklins acquired the large Warikipu, Fred Frederick Landman, Landman permanently loaned the American Museum of Natural History three Wari pendant type kipus. A year later, in 1978, the same year the Conklins bought the large Warikipu, they were gifted to the museum along with 44 other objects which in addition to the kipus included ceramics, textiles, et cetera, but all apparently unrelated. So unfortunately, we don't have contextual information for them. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Curiously, one of the kipus donated by the landmans was in a rolled up state. The large worry kipu was also acquired in a rolled up state. And this is unusual because antiquities dealers typically doctor their merchandise to show them at their best. This means they would usually wish to show the kipus in their open state, especially the large worry kipus, so all its colorful co cords could have been seen. To me, this suggests that the large worry kipu and the landman kipus, the three landman kipus, might have come from the same dealer and probably the same original source. And it was, what are the odds that two wakeros in the same, at the same time would both decide not to open their big wari kipus. Further, the outer surface of the large wari kipu's main cord and the lower portions of its pendant cords, um, this is a, a view of the, of the main cord, uh, the side that shows this, this um, it, they're, they're coated with a resin that has become impregnated with dirt and it's red colored. Uh, this this uh, resin is especially prominent on the outer side of the of the main cord and the lower half of the of the kipu's pendant cords. Interestingly, a similar substance coats the end of a kipu-like cord that was included in the landman accession. So the landman kipus came with other objects I mentioned, and, and one of them was uh, was this object, this kipu-like set of cords, and it also has this resin on it. <clears throat> so my question is, you know, the, I, I think this strengthens the argument that, that you know, they were, they came into exist, or, you know, they were, they were um, purchased by the Landmans and the Conklins all about the same time. They all had rolled, they both had rolled kipus and they both had these resins, suggesting to me that they came from the same source. We may never know where the large worry kipu came from. However, in 2003, Conklin submitted a sample of it to the University of Arizona's AMS facility for carbon dating. And the resulting measurement determined that the kipu is 1,151 plus or minus 33 years old, which corresponds with approximately 779 to 981 CE. This was the first carbon-14 date ever made of a wari kipu, and it is in line with the middle horizon phase two when the Wari Empire reached its greatest extent. Gary Urton carbon dated three of the Landman kipus at the American Museum of Natural History, and the dates for all the Wari kipus fall within 100 years of each other. This, I think, further convinces me that they all must have come from the same source. At this point, I've presented what we know about the large Wari kipus context, and, but it has a lot more 
you know, which essentially we don't we don't know where it came from, but it probably came with from with other kipus. But um, it has a lot more to tell us. Uh, let's begin with a description of its form and construction. The large worry kipu is made of 100% cotton. It has five strand braided a five strand braided main cord, which is unique. It has 101 wrapped pendant cords shown here that are arranged in 20 groups of five pendants each and that are separated with spaces. One group, group four, however, is different. It has six pendants instead of five. And the sixth pendant constitute, which I call cord 21, um, and it, it differs from all the other pendant cords in the, in the kipu. For example, it has eight double overhand knots and an eight-fold overhand knot. Uh, I don't know what these knots were for, but they seem to be complementary, where one is a single knot made with eight half hitches and the other is eight double, double overhand knots that together make a, a single group. Whatever the meaning, the eight-fold knot is the largest known in any kipu. Another unusual feature of cord 21 is its wrapping. While the other 100 pendant cords in the kipu are wrapped with a single color called monochrome wrapping, pendant 21 has three bands, two monochrome reddish brown and one made of a mottled reddish brown and white yarn. Pendant cord 21 has two subsidiary cords, which is also different. The others have 10. Each Pending cord has a single knot, each subsidiary cord sorry, has a single knot, and one of them is monochrome golden brown, and the other is light brown and medium brown with a barber pole pattern. Both subsidiary cords have their own subsidiary cords whose colors are the same as their parent cords, and each has two knots. Another unusual feature of the large worry keep is that it is unfinished. The, the final three groups are missing many of their subsidiary cords, and the last group has no, no subsidiaries at all. This, this group. Can, does that show up, the, the, the laser? Okay. Further, the large worry kipu has four pseudo pendant cords, which are pendant cords without wrapping, knots, or subsidiary cords. They are also shorter than the wrapped pending cords and they are structurally distinct as well. Two of them shown here are found near the end of the kipu and their purpose is unknown. Although Conklin believes they were used to secure the keep believed they were used to secure the kipu during its fabrication. And, and that is, you know, as good of a reason as any. Maybe it was hung. You know, one of the questions was, you know, how, what were, how were they displayed? Despite the fact that the large worry kipu is made entirely of cotton, it is incredibly colorful. Color, knots, and position are the organizing principles thought to govern the coding practices of most Inca and post-Inca kipus. So my question, questions here are as follows. You know, were the same conventions governing Inca and later, Inca, later kipus practiced by the worry and seen in the large worry kipu? If not, what mechanisms were used to encode and retrieve information? What were their organizing structures? While I cannot cover all of this in a 30-minute talk, I can focus on a few points, beginning with a discussion of color. Wari kipus are perhaps the most colorful of all the kipu traditions. If wari kipus employed the same principles utilized in Inca and later kipus, uh, they, they um, uh, they, they must have used, you know, using color knots in position. We should see evidence of this in the attributes of the large worry kipu, and, and we do. It's presumed that <clears throat> color in kipus represents categories of information from the identity, or this is of Inca, in Inca kipus, from the identity of individuals, communities, and livestock to the implementation of corvée labor and its byproducts. If so, color should be built into the structure of Ori Kipus too, if they're using this system. And like I said, it is. As Gary Erton has already showed you, Ori Kipus come in three types. I, well, maybe you didn't. I think they, I, um, <laughs> uh, loop and branch, pendant, and wrapped pendant. 
and the, lo the large Wari Kipu is a pendant type. Um, Wari Kipu pendant cords are usually monochrome white, but color was added to them with spiral wrapping, which is a labor intensive practice. Color was also incorporated into the basic structure of the subsidiary cords. Colored cords were plied and replied to make patterns that include monochrome modeled barber pole and segmented colors. When multiple colored pendant cords are attached to a cord, they form color patterns of their own, which Erton, which Erton has written about and, and Sabine Highland called color banding and color seriation. Kipus with color banding have groups of pendant cords of the same color adjacent to bands with different colors. It, this is here. Um, Kipus with color seriation have several pendant cords, each with a different color pattern that form a group. The sequence of colored cords repeat in each group, which are separated with spaces on the main cord. For example, this is a diagram. These are diagrams of seriated Kipus with red, yellow, blue, and purple and green wrapping. In colonial pendant type Kipus, color banding is associated with individual and local level accounting while seriated kipus encode information pertaining to higher levels. So, so this, would, a, this would be a model of a seriated kipu, which would theoretically um, be encoding information about higher level, like community, uh, villages, towns, information where color banding would encode information about individuals. Theor theor that, this is how we think, anyways, colonial and Inca kipus might have worked. <clears throat> The large worry, uh, kipu, on the other hand, is, oh, sorry. Uh, I do not know of any banded worry kipus, except possibly one that is in here in the, amuse in the American Museum of Natural History. But this kipu has no subsidiary cords or knots. And it is, and looking at it, it it's part of the Landman collection. And looking at it with the other two kipus, it's clear other two kipus in the landman gift, it's clear that the pendants on this kipu were meant to be used as blanks, like key blanks that were made ahead of time and used as and transferred onto other kipus as they were needed. <clears throat> and you can see there are, are blanks here, or, or spaces here where it looks like perhaps kipu cords might have been removed. The large worry kipu, on the other hand, is clearly a seriated kipu with monochrome color wrapping, so it might have pertained to higher level information. Each pendant cord is wrapped with one of five different colors that repeat, beginning with dark green or blue green, followed by dark reddish brown, light reddish brown, light golden brown or tan, and then blue. The single, ex it's kind of important to remember that sequence is it's going to come up a lot. It's, um, the single exception to this seriation is cord 21, which we've already talked about, which has three bands. Uh, subsidiary cords in most, if not all, wari kipus are also color seriated, meaning that each subsidiary cord on a pendant cord has a different color, which makes a sequence that repeats more or less on all the pendant cords of the kipu. Each pendant cord in the large worry kipu has nine or 10 subsidiary cords shown here. They have a color seriation that is strictly followed. It's one of the most strictly followed kipus I've ever seen. Um, the uh, beginning with barber pole reddish brown and white followed by a solid reddish brown. You know, I, I'm not gonna go through all the colors but there's 10 of them that repeat. These color Subsidiary, subsidiary cords are found on every pendant of the kipu, except those that are unfinished. And interesting, the shade of color the, uh, on these subsidiaries is not consistent across the kipu, meaning that every kipu, ha every kipu subsidiary cord has the same basic color of blue, orange, yellow, brown, etc but their brightness and intensities differ across the kipu. At first, I thought that these color differences were the result of unequal preservation. And see, what I'm, what I'm pointing out here is see the blue in this, on these two? 
it's very different from the blue on these two. You see. Can you just zoom out one Sure. I think. I don't know. No. It, is that doing any? I can't see it. Um, can, can you see yeah. where? Maybe it's just, maybe the, I hope the battery's not going. But, so, is there, is there a pointer? Or? If it's use your hand, it'll be great. Okay, like over here. So, the, um, so if you look at the blues, they're, they're different. If you look here, the, the orange here, yeah, yeah. is quite, is brighter than the orange here. <laughs> and the, the brown on the, with this blue here is quite different from the browns over, especially here, this is a much yeah. darker brown. Yeah. And it's not just, this is not just differences in preservation. Th these are, it's clearly, they're, they're, they're bounded by the group. <clears throat> so it, in fact, they, the colors coincide with, with pairs of groups on the, in the, of the 10 pendant chord groups, or 20 groups. Um, Pre-Columbian people, they had to use natural dyes as their sources of color, and natural dyes are difficult to replicate exactly. Each dye vat produces a different shade. Consistent replication of color was not achieved until the development of modern aniline dyes. The presence of multiple shades of colors that are not entirely caused by unequal preservation and to me, implies that the large worry Kipu's subsidiary chords were dyed in multiple vats. And this, in turn, suggests one of two scenarios. One, the subsidiary chords were made by different people using diff separate vats. Or two, subsidiary chords were made by one person over time using multiple vats, like maybe annually. In the first scenario, the keep, and by the way, when you're using natural dyes, you're dealing, you're, you're reliant on plants that have seasonal growths and things, so that there's, there's good reason to see it, see it that way. Um, so in the first scenario, the kipu could have been assembled all at once, um, made from cords brought in by other people, or it could have, in the second scenario, the kipu could have been made it could have been a living document that was made over time by a single person, like a Kipu Kamayak, maybe. In my study of the subsidiary chords, however, I look at the structures, and they are providing some supporting. They are they are providing some very interesting information about the the subsidiary chords. When, and they suggest that multiple people made them over time. So I'm really sorry about these tables, but it's the only way I can really get this information across. What, what's important here in this table is not so much the, the information inside the, the cells, but it's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to help with color. So this table presents the color, the cord, the subsidiary cord structures associated with the, the subsidiary cords in the, in the, um, in the, in the image below. So each, each group of kipus is represented by a column in the table. Okay, and the, the, remember there were 10 subsidiary cords that, you know, 10 different colors of subsidiary cords. So each row represents one of those, those um, subsidiary cord colors or, or types. And so in the cells then show the, the structure the, the average structure, they all differ a little bit, that, uh, that are found in, in that particular group. <laughs> if that is, I hope this is making sense. So, and what I did then is I, where, when, the, when the, the structures in adjacent groups were very similar to each other or identical, I, I colored them green. If they were not similar, I colored them white. And, and then, um, and then I put in also a, a red line between those in, in the cell borders between those that are not similar. And what you can see is it suggests that, that at least in the first group of 10 and the last group of 10, they were made by the same person, those chords. And the middle group of 10 
uh, it, it, it seems to be that they were made by multiple people, even though it's two, two groups. And uh, so it, it's not really helping me. So it seems like it's almost a combination of the first two scenarios, that maybe there are multiple people bring, making these, um, and there's a single person making them. If the, it, it's a joint effort, probably, between maybe billet people outside of, a, of the area and, and a Kibu Kamaya. I, I, it's the best guess I can, or best um, interpretation I can make right now of this information. So, <clears throat> so at this point, I'd like to move into the second um, principle uh, of, of Kipu coding, and that's knots and position. Um, knots and position are essentially inseparable, and is. Um, and uh, Inca Kipus, Inca Kipus employed a ten, base ten positional system to represent numbers on Kipu chords. And knots in both Inca and post Inca Kipus represent numbers, but they could also represent qualitative information. We think, as Sabine Highland has so nicely shown in in the Kipu boards, where she has found that. Uh, knots tied on to chords on Inca Kipu boards have a, a twist of S or Z that can indicate a parishioner's moiety where the color of the chord represents that the person himself or herself. And, <clears throat> and but apparently other attributes could also indicate moiety such as chord attachment and Gary Urton and Manny Medrano has have used this uh, the several kipus from the Santa Valley, plus a translation of those kipus to show that that moiety was indicated in these kipus with the chord attachment, which can be recto or verso. And so this diagram shows both the chord attachment and knot twist. By the way, just so you know, I use a different system than Gary Urton does for knot twist. I look at the actual twist in the, the knot when it's being made, and the reason why I do that is because wari kibus often have double overhand knots and triple overhand knots. Where so, in the there there is in in the Inca system of looking at knots, they they actually look at the at this part of the knot that crosses the back, and it actually so if you have an S twisted knot, it's actually would be a Z knot in Gary's system. So they're opposite, but we don't have those crosses in, in Wari Kipu, so I can't use that, that system. Anyways, <clears throat> this is a dot. What, what I found very interesting in the large Wari Kipu is that it seems to be using knot twist like the Kipu boards um, to possibly indicate something like moiety. Um, in, this, in this image, I, what I've what I'm showing you here is that the large wari kipu, the first half of it, all of the knots on all the pending chords and subsidiary chords have an S twist, where in the second half of the kipu, they're all they all have a Z twist, and it's really interesting to me. I bet I, I just you know we don't even know if the wari had moieties. We, I I presume they probably did, but the the um uh. And we don't, again, we don't know if that's what's going on here. There could be time involved. Maybe the S knots are involved with one year and the Z knots are another year. It could be a lot of different interpretations. <clears throat> so all the large worry, or the large worry Kipu does not seem to have encoded information, however, using chord twist because all of its chords have a final twist of Z, which is normal for worry Kipus while Inca kipus tend to have an S twist. Um, coded information, however, might be in present, present in the chord attachments. For instance, 535 chords in the large wari kipu, which are slightly more than half, have, no, have recto attachments where 416 slightly less than half have verso attachments, but I, at this time I have not had been able to investigate this further. But one of the most interesting features, I think, of the large wari kipu is found 
in its pattern of um, knot twist that I showed you. <clears throat> so the, the numerical system used in Wari kipus is not well understood. But we do have one kipu that might be giving us a clue. What, what, we, what we know is that knots are always tied immediately after wrapping or cord attachment in Wari kipus, which is very different than Inca, because remember, Inca kipus have a base 10 positional system. So the ones are on the bottom, tens are next in the next register, 100, 1,000. Wari kipus, the knots are always tied right after they're attached to the cord or right after wrapping. So there's no positional system. So how did they re record numbers greater than 10? And I, I still don't know. Um, although we're, they were quite creative in their use of overhand knots. See, they, they also, Wari, Wari keepers also do not have anything but overhand knots. They use double overhand, triple overhand, wrapped overhand, colored overhand, but no long knots, no figure eight knots. So, but they were very clever in their use of, of double overhand. And, and, but I still don't know if they were using that as a positional system. But there is a kipu here, kipu 136, which was part of the Dumbart, part of the Conklin donation that's providing some insights as to how kipus might have been used numerically. And they seem to be used, they seem to have a function similar to top cords, and I'm going to show you. So in this pendant kipu, pendant type kipu, which it consists of five pendant cord groups labeled, and the first pendant of each group is not wrapped, and it is it has subsidiary cords whose color sequence is repeated in each pendant cord, like in the large wari kipu. A numerical system is revealed if one adds, this is a little hard to, to describe, but bear with me. So if, if one adds up all the knots on the subsidiary cords of the same color in the group, they equal the number of knots in the first kipu cord of the, of the group. And I'll, but I'll, I'll show you what I'm, how this works. So this is a photo of the of the kipu that has this this um, mechanism, and I'm going to zoom in on group one, and group one is made of ten pendant cords, and now I'm going to zoom in on the first pendant of the ten. Remember, this is this is this is typical of all of the five groups where the first pendant is not wrapped, and this first pendant, like the others, um, has five subsidiary cords that each have a different color, a color pattern, which I, use, uh, which I mark in Roman numerals to set them off from, from the others. Um, although, of course, over here I don't. Oh, no, those are the, <laughs> no. Uh, um, so what you're seeing here are the, the um, is the, an imp, a photo of the first pendant cord, and then uh, my diagram of it. And my, in my diagram, along the pendant cord itself, you see the, the group numbers. And then to the right are the number of knots. And so now, if we back out a, get, a bit, now I have a diagram of all 10 pendant cords in that first group. And it shows there are subsidiary cords and the number of knots tied on them. And what you see is that each of the cords has one or more of these subsidiary cords. None of them have all of them except the first one. And what you'll notice is that if you add, except, unfortunately, you have to ignore the first one. But if you look at types two through five, if the, they, the, the, subsidiary, the number of knots on the subsidiary cords in cords two, pendant cords two through not 10 equal the number of knots in the first one. And here's a chart that shows, unfortunately, that's an unreadable chart, but the, um, <laughs> but what I, th these are the, um, the I'm, let me digress for just one second here. What, the reason why I put this chart up is, is to show you the, the types of numbers we see in this kipu. Um, if you notice, most of them are ones. And, and that's really typical of, of Wari Kipus. They're, almost all the cards just have one knot or no knot. And it seems to me like a binary system is at work here, where it's present absent. 
But then there are some keepers, which I show you, some chords that I've highlighted in red that have more than one. And those are the only ones that have more than one knot. And, but they are never more than nine. Yes, Gary. OK. And um, so I think there's a base 10 system also at work here. So a base 10 and a, and a binary system. But so here is a chart showing you the first in the, it's, it's 10 columns, two columns each representing each group. The first column shows the number of knots on the first chord. The second column shows the sum of the knots of the same color in the rest of that group. And you can see, in general, they, they add up. Here's the exceptions. And there are, there are very few you know, for in, this, in this kipu. And one of them, the one in the right corner here, I'm going to show you. It's because, so this last group here, if we were to move this five to the first column, it would work. So, and if you notice that the chord that's out of place is this blue chord that's tied at the all the way at the bottom of the keep of the pendant chord, and that's really unusual. I've never seen that before. And I thought maybe Bill had tinkered with it, Bill Conklin, <laughs> and and maybe he had you know tied it back in the wrong place. But when the conservator and I went to look at it, it's very tightly tied. It was it. He did not. He didn't. I can't blame Bill for this. <laughs> and, but um, so it was on. It was made like this, but if I, if, like I said, if you move this five over, it works. You, three plus two is five. But, so I think what's happening is that they're, they're giving us these intentionally. They're telling us to look at this. You know, it's different. The, the Kipu Kamayak or whatever, I'm sure they understood this principle. They knew that that should have, probably that pendant chord would have normally been in the first, that subsidiary chord would have been on the first pendant chord, but, uh, but it's not. <laughs> Anyways, um, I have to move through this quickly, so because there's the best is yet to come. Um, so the the large worry keep who has. Um, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> well, I'll try to go through this quickly then. Okay, so the large worry keep who, as I said, it, its pendant chords are wrapped. They also follow a, se a sequence, a series, one through five. And if you look, the, so these are the one through five, and the, I don't have them labeled, but each one of these columns represents. A, um, a, a pendant chord. And this is the number of knots on that pendant chord. So the blue, blue pendant chord, are, they're type one. The next one, type two. And the blue pendant chords always have three or four knots. If there are two exceptions. The next always have seven, next five, two, one. No exceptions, right? And in the, the subsidiary chords are the same way. They have there, but th there's more. There's more exceptions, but, but, um, but in general, they have either one or no knots, and though, but some colors are are um, associated with other numbers, like uh, number the number two. So th in this table, the number of knots is as long in the columns. The the subsidiary chord type is in the row, and these are the number of chords that have that. So sixty five chords have two have two knots. Uh, 35 chords have five knots. So it's, it's um, you see, I've highlighted them in green. They're, they, in other, what I'm trying to get at is color is associated with number on the, in, these, in these kipus. And the number 46 keeps coming up, which is weird to me too. But in general, most of the color chords are associated with zero, with zero or one. So I wondered how, how similar is this to other kipus? Is this, does this exist anywhere else? And the only other kipu I know of that's even the, that's the most similar to the large worry kipu is a kipu T1 from Castillo de Warme, which was excavated um, in 2013. And like the large worry kipu, the Castillo de Warme kipu also has a series of, of subsidiary chords one through nine, there's eight A and eight B, but that's nine. They also have numbers associated with color. Their, their colors are also associated with numbers, to mostly one, but some others, four, six. But what I find most interesting is that its pendant chords are also monochrome wrapped. And it's pendant, like, they were, like the large worry Hebrew, but it's monochrome, its pendant chords are also associated with numbers very, consistently. One, two, five, seven, six. Did you see those numbers before? They're the same numbers as in the large Warikipu. One, two, five, seven, three, and four. 
21576. And what's even more interesting is if you match the colors, so it's, they were a, a slightly out of order, but the colors associated with them are the same. So the blue, the blue wrapping in the large Warikipu is associated with one, the blue on the large in the Castillo de Warme Kipu is also associated with one. The gold is associated with two. The tan is associated with five. Brown is associated with seven. And the blue-green is associated in one with three or four and the other with six. So here for the first time, we really are seeing evidence that color seems to be associated with number. In the subsidiary cards, I think it's just, you know, it's, it might be whatever color they're using. But here we have from two different sites probably, two different kipus, maybe not even the same age. They're, they have very different spinning and plying. Their card constructions are very different from one, another, from one another. I do not think they're coming from the same site, but yet they're using the same numbers with the same colors. It all, this is, seems to suggest to me that there was a common understanding of a, the meaning of color in, in the worry, but I don't know if they're, you know, what all it means, but I think that's what's going on. So the last thing I have to plug, the, the Dumbarton Oaks, we have an exhibition coming up that I'm co-curating. It's going to open on April 2nd, and it's going to display the seven worry kipus from the Conklin donation, and I hope you all can come. <laughs> I guess I don't have time. <laughs> yes. I was going to say your last slide also maybe has some import in terms of the extent of Wari control over their empire, yes. right? An issue that's much debated. But boy, if they're consistent across that distance, that's very interesting information. It is. It is. Hi, um, I'll be brief. We've often, this is more a comment, you know, we often talk about some of the similarities between the Central Andean kipus and the Wari ones in terms of the colors. Just looking at your list of the colors of the subsidiary cords on the Dunbarton Oaks um, kipu, those are, it's like I know all those patterns yeah. because yeah. those are on the Mangas kipu board as well, which is 19th mm -hmm. century. Yeah. I mean, there are more the color blue patterns. And white, the, yeah. Uh -huh. It's yeah. like, wow. Thank you. Yeah, I see them too in Gary's in to keep his shows. Okay. Yeah, maybe one more. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, Congratulations. I am very impressed for your information. And uh, well, I am impressed also by the color of the cotton, uh, especially the orange one. When I was working with a textile from the Wakako uh, Viejo, uh, collection, I realized that uh, pink color and orange color appears at the middle also, mm -hmm. and have relation also with gender. Men uh, wear this uh, tunic in pink color, and women use this dress in orange color. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, have, uh, uh, I think you have to take attention with this difference in gender and could be some significance in, the, yeah. in, in your kipos. And I have another um, question. is about the uh, uh, yellow color and the green color, or uh, natural color, or the dye, the, the cotton? The, the yellow? Uh, the, the yellow, the yellow, yellow and green. The yellow is dye. And the which other one? Green. The green. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've seen green, natural greens, but they're usually a lot lighter than yes. this green. This is uh, a very dark, dark olive green. Now, and I don't know if the green has darkened over time because of age or if it was originally that, that color. But my suspicion is that it's a dye. That, but I don't know for sure. But I've never seen that dark of green in a 